tonight on CBC Vancouver News. For a lot of school boards, this would also be about um, ensuring safety as far as they can, reassuring parents. Get vaccinated or face consequences. The call on other school districts to follow Delta's new COVID mandate for staff. Also, either you have to find a second job somewhere, otherwise you can't survive, you can't even feed your family. Frustration from BC truckers. New environmental rules at the Port of Vancouver mean more struggles for some barely hanging on. And a reality check from BC Children's Hospital. How kids in our province are faring against COVID. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Anita is away tonight. We begin with calls for more BC school districts to follow Delta's lead in mandating staff to disclose their vaccination status. The CBC's Michelle Gassoub is speaking with teachers and parents who say as Omicron spreads, it's time to draw a hard line. The Delta School District is taking on what the province wouldn't do, mandating that teachers disclose whether they're vaccinated or not. It's a move the BCTF hopes to see duplicated in other districts. You know, it's great to see the Delta School Board um, taking this step. Um, we would like to see other school boards take similar steps, especially in those parts of the province with low vaccination rates. Unlike mandates in some other sectors, teachers who are unvaccinated won't automatically lose their job. Instead, they'll have to undergo regular rapid testing or be placed on unpaid leave. I think what we are hoping is that because we are offering testing, which is paid by the school district as an option or an unpaid leave, that this will cause uh, staff to consider whether they really want to leave the district or not. And we're hoping they'll stay. The district is paying for the tests out of pocket and doesn't yet know how often they'll happen or how many teachers could be lost. The numbers that we're using are those that came from the BC Centre for Disease Control and they indicate that the whole city of Delta is, is very well vaccinated. Um, so we're assuming that our staff are as well, but that's all we know, we are assuming. 95% of teachers in BC are vaccinated, but that number is much lower in some districts. Parents at this West End school say they'd welcome a similar mandate at the Vancouver School Board. I think I'd want to know. Um, I think it's important to know, especially in these times right now. Say I, I feel more comfortable for the teachers because it's protecting them, right? It's not so much as they're going to get the children sick, right? So I feel more comfortable for the teachers. The VSB and every other district rejected mandatory vaccines for teachers in the fall. And for some, mandates are still a controversial move. There's a privacy line that I haven't figured out what I, I truly believe yet. Teachers in Delta now have six weeks to disclose their vaccine status. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, the vast majority of schools in BC are still doing in-person teaching, but we're now aware of at least four functional closures because of staff shortages. One school each in Mission, Armstrong, Hazleton and Surrey have been forced to go to online learning. Meanwhile, COVID-19 hospitalizations in BC have hit a new high, adding 34 more people since yesterday for a total of 534 patients. The number of people in ICU remains the same at 102, Half of those patients are unvaccinated. BC also declared five new health care facility outbreaks today and said one is over. There are now 53 outbreaks ongoing and deaths from COVID are also up in our province. Seven more people have died from the disease in the last day. Still, daily booster shots in our province keep hitting record highs. Today, more than 58,000 British Columbians received a third dose. 1.3 million people, a third of our adult population, are now triple vaxxed. And today, pregnant people are eligible for quicker booster shots. If it's been at least eight weeks since you received their second dose, you can book now. Anyone who indicates they're pregnant on the Get Vaccinated system will get an automatic invite. The vast majority of adults in BC are vaccinated against COVID. And while kids aged 12 plus are mostly double covered, it's children 5 to 11 who lag far behind. For many of these parents, we know the parents themselves are vaccinated. And so we need to try and figure out why it is that they haven't uh, registered their children or vaccinated them. And I suspect for many of them, it's not because they don't want to vaccinate their kids. It might just be about access to an appointment or not knowing how to go about it. So we need to think about that access piece as well. 
Provincial data shows nearly half of the 350,000 children between 5 to 11 years old have not been registered for a vaccine. When the vaccinations were first made available in November, many families hurry to get their kids immunized. Since then, the rate of pediatric, pediatric COVID shots has slowed. Some health experts say parents need to be reassured the vaccine is safe for children. Coming up in about 10 minutes, we're going to talk to a doctor from BC Children's Hospital on what they're seeing in children with COVID and their advice to parents and guardians. Police have released new video showing a young homicide victim just days before his body was found dumped by the side of the road in the BC interior. Take a look. RCMP hopes someone can help identify the three men seen walking with 21-year-old Clayton Dyer. Dyer leads them through a residential building lobby around 4.30 on October 10th until all four get in that elevator. The men are considered potential witnesses, but police won't know what information they have, if any, until they can speak with them. Dyer's body was found on October 13th, about five kilometers west of Penticton. 2021 saw more than 1,800 people killed by poison drugs in BC, the deadliest year ever recorded so far. Now the provincial government is giving more resources to help people in our construction industry. The million dollar grant is going to expand the tailgate toolkit program, piloted by the Vancouver Island Construction Association last year. It's aimed at increasing access to harm reduction services and ideas for construction workers who may be dealing with shame and stigma. And of these toxic drug deaths where we know where someone worked, nearly 20% of those who died work in construction trades or as equipment operators. So today we are taking an important step to reach out and support those working in construction and trades. The program involves holding focus groups for people working in all levels of construction to share their experiences of how drug use affects their industry. The Tailgate Toolkit program will be expanded to include construction industry associations across BC. The internment of Japanese Canadians is one of the darkest chapters in our country's history. And one of the most compelling stories from that period is Vancouver's Asahi Tigers baseball team. Well, Kei Kamanishi was the team's third baseman, and he turned 100 years old on Monday. Kamanishi was a member of the Asahi Tigers until 1941, when it was disbanded because the players were sent to those camps. His uniform and glove are on display at the Nikkei National Museum as part of their safe home exhibit. He also has a scholarship named after him. A big birthday bash is planned for him later in the year. Happy birthday, Mr. Kamenishi. BC's basket, basketball community is now mourning player and beloved teacher Mel Davis. He was a former Harlem Globetrotter who went on to teach BC kids how to play ball. As John Hernandez shows us, his alumni hope to carry on his long legacy. <laughs> Have ball, will teach. That was Mel Davis's motto. The Vancouver player always had a trick up his sleeve and wisdom to go with it. Bingo. If you can fall down, get yourself back up. This is what is taught to me and was taught to me about basketball. And from basketball, that was taught to me in life. Check it, baby. Davis was born in Chicago, where he thrived on the court. But growing up in Chicago in the snow, and when I wanted to play basketball, a group of us guys would get out, get some shovels, shovel the court clean, and get out there and play basketball. And for me playing basketball, that kept me out of uh, the penitentiary, it kept me out of a lot of crime. He played for the Harlem Globetrotters from 1961 to 1979, more than 300 games a year across the world. And he got the nickname Trick. He later settled in Vancouver and started a family and began passing his knowledge down to youth. Basketball and education goes together like right and left hand. A lot of times I feel that the guys who are 50 and, and over, they, they lose out on what they learn to contribute back to the new generation that's coming up. Davis founded Kitsilano Youth Basketball in Vancouver and taught the game to thousands of kids, including local professional baller Joel Haywood. I it just fell in love because I felt like was, that was a place for me uh, to, 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 get, uh, to become a good, really good basketball player, but also just seeing a pos positive, you know, a black uh, role model. 
Haywood found out Davis was in the hospital late last year and would go on to visit as much as he could. I grabbed his, uh, his, his hands and I, you know, was talking to him, stuff like that, and he was holding it tight and stuff like that. And I just saw a lot of energy from him. Davis died at 84 of natural causes, but his legacy lives on. He leaves behind a large family and countless students who carry on his teachings. They're campaigning for a plaque in his name at the Kitsilano Community Center that would honor his love for the game. This was my love for basketball. Most of the time you see me, I, I ride the bus a lot, and you see me with a basketball, and guys say, hey, that go to basketball, man. This is my, uh, this is my makeup. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. A cold snap followed by a quick melt and heavy rain has left roads across Metro Vancouver and the island a cratered mess. There are plenty of potholes, and that has authorities and driving instructors telling you to slow down. If you hit a pothole at speed, you can damage your car, blow up your tire, amongst other things, and a quick swerve to miss one can cause a crash. Cities say they're trying to repair them as quickly as they can and urge anyone who sees one to call their city or town to get it filled. Surrey, Nanaimo, and uh, Saanich all say they have more potholes than normal. Time for our first glance at the weather. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us with the forecast. Seen a few potholes around, Joe. Didn't swerve too drastically, but they're nasty. <laughs> They are. I've also noticed them, Dan. Yeah, and while the weather is much calmer in the forecast, we're still seeing those impacts from extreme cold and extreme warm-ups, potholes and pipes. Also hearing a, a few uh, burst pipes as ice makes their way through. But let me show you the current temperatures. I'm so pleased to uh, tell you that we do have some calmer weather in the forecast. I am not tracking a big system impacting most of the province. In fact, high pressure building uh, we do have some drizzle and some marine fog to get through uh, for the south coast. Temperatures are still quite mild. Six right now out towards YVR, five in through Abbotsford. Most of the island down a couple more degrees. But watch as I take you through the overnight forecast. Staying fairly mild, up around four, fives, and sixes for most of Metro Vancouver. A few degrees above our uh, last 30-year average seasonal anyway. Uh, and we'll stay mild for a couple more days. So whatever lingering patches of ice and snow, and we still do have a few patches, North Shore out towards the valley. I've even seen a few in some alleys in East Van, uh, and then of course up towards Squamish, Pemberton. Still some snow sticking around. Uh, the warm temperatures and high pressure over the next couple of days should continue to melt that. Uh, we're seeing some activity up towards Haidegui northward, but Dan, it is very nice to have a night where we do not have widespread warnings, and we've got a few more days of this. In fact, I decided not even to go outside. I need a break. I'm in. Really? <laughs> outside? You? Yeah. Do you to look out the window. Check mm. my map. Oh, that's a yep. good way to check the weather. <laughs> I know. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. The weather update is brought to you by Sophia Financial Group of Raymond James Limited. Register now for our free cash flow connection series at sophiaevents.ca. Doctors at BC Children's Hospital are seeing the impact of Omicron on kids firsthand. Eleven children are in hospital. About a quarter of them are actually admitted for COVID-19. Some are coming in for other reasons and then test positive for the disease. There's also a concern with low vaccination rates among children 5 to 11 in some areas of our province. For more, we're now joined by Dr. Madish Sadarangani. He's an infectious disease pediatrician with BC Children's Hospital. Doctor, first of all, what are you seeing with children in hospital with COVID in terms of severity and symptoms? Yes, yeah, so I think, as you've mentioned, we're seeing, you know, it's a small number of children in hospital, but a steady flow of children in hospital. And, you know, it's a mixture of severity, some in intensive care, others just on the general wards. And the main symptoms that lead to children ending up needing to be in hospital are either difficulty with their breathing and needing breathing support or challenges with hydration and fluid intake and needing fluid support. In terms of treatment, how are you seeing them respond? Yeah, so unfortunately for, for these kids, for the most part, we don't have any specific treatments um, for the virus itself. So what we're really providing is supportive care to support them through this, to make sure they don't get dehydrated, make sure their breathing is supported and, and their body is oxygenated um, and the, so that their body can fight off the virus infection and really just tie them over that period when the disease is most severe. 
Now, now we have heard from, from other doctors and medical professionals that the children are generally less susceptible to getting COVID and that Omicron symptoms may be less severe. We know that's not the case in, in, in some cases. Is that what you're seeing in terms of kids? Yeah, so, so right now we have, you know, we're continuing to see kids in hospital. We have not seen a significant surge of the numbers of children in hospital with COVID as, you know, compared with earlier parts of this pandemic. And I think it's something we just have to watch day by day and week by week, and, and that may change. Um, but certainly what we're seeing here is not necessarily the same as what is seen elsewhere. Now, we know there are some concerns about low vaccination rates, as we mentioned, among children 5 to 11. In, in, for example, in Northern Health, uh, yesterday our story told us that it was 26%. Uh, what is your message to parents who may be reluctant to get their children vaccinated because they think uh, the symptoms of Omicron will be less, will be less severe? Yeah, so I think when we see these low vaccination rates for any vaccine, there's, you know, the simplest way of thinking about it is what we call the three C's in terms of why, the, why they're low. So that's lack of confidence, complacency, or lack of convenience. So I think in terms of the, the confidence piece, I think people were waiting to get a lot of safety data. And we now have seen millions of children in North America receiving this vaccine, and there's no concerns around the safety. I, I think in terms of the, the complacency, and that's where what you're mentioning, which is where parents are, are not thinking this is a severe disease in children. While fortunately for most children, it's a mild disease. Some children do have a severe disease and it's almost impossible to predict which children those are going to be. Um, and so, you know, we can't have a targeted vaccination campaign and the most effective way is to try and vaccinate as many children as possible. And then the third C, that convenience piece, you know, I think everyone's working as hard as possible to make it as convenient as possible for everyone across the province to be able to access vaccines for themselves and their, and their children. Dr. Manish Sadarangani, we appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. A reckoning for royal. The Queen is taking the Royal Highness title from her son, Prince Andrew, as he heads to court. The latest from the UK after this. Thank you for staying with us on our commercial free live stream. Hello to everybody watching online. The pandemic has given way to many new innovations, including the creation of new sports. CBC's Valeria Cory Minocchio visits a racket club that's developed a combination of squash and pickleball. It's called Squickleball. The game combines pickleball's rules, point scoring system and equipment inside the four walls of a double squash court. What we've added is, is the ability to hit off the side walls and also off the back wall. Avid squickleball player and enthusiast John Archer is on the court at Club Atwater first thing most mornings. This is becoming the most important part of my day, actually. Uh, I start off uh, looking forward to coming out here to play. Um, I live alone, so I don't have a lot of social contact, especially these days. So this is also my social contact, as well as my exercise. Squickleball would not exist without the pandemic. It all started last April, when Quebec's COVID restrictions on indoor sports were in full swing. Members of the club set up a pickleball net in the doubles court to stay active while sticking within provincial health guidelines. So squickleball uh, looked like it was going to die with the recovery of the, from the pandemic, but it's back. Quebec reintroduced limits on indoor sports in late December. Without squickleball, double squash courts wouldn't have much use. For the longest time, the doubles courts were seeing no action, and the nice thing was that we were kept racking our brains to see how many people we can get in safely, and it was kind of a no-brainer, and like I said, with the collaboration of some members and their initiative, which was really nice, we were able to get the courts going and keep people active. The sport drummed up some interest last year. When we were talking about this sport uh, last May, uh, we did get uh, interest from uh, across the country. So I don't know if other clubs have taken it up or not. I hope they have. Still, Archer doesn't expect the game to take over double squash once people are allowed to play again. But for now... When life gives you lemons, you make squickleball. Valeria Corey Minocchio, CBC News, Montreal.
In Ontario, the province reported a new high of more than 3,600 COVID cases with about 500 people in ICU. This is the fourth straight day where the number of hospitalizations has climbed. And as Thomas Dagla tells us, many hospital staff are taking time off because they're sick and in many cases exhausted. Being unvaccinated made Randy Sams and his wife more vulnerable to severe COVID. Now they can only speak on FaceTime while he recovers in hospital and she's sick at home. You doing okay? Yeah, today's a, not a real good day. No. He was worried about side effects from the vaccine, so Sams wouldn't take it. He was rushed to hospital on Christmas Day and spent two weeks in intensive care. Could have been put on life support. I just missed it. It could have been a lot worse. I've I'm lucky to be living. At Blue Water Health in Sarnia, patients like him are treated in a special COVID ward. Staff are warned about those still potentially infectious with a purple sign and that symbol meaning COVID positive. The Omicron wave has sent patients to this hospital at a rate unseen in the pandemic, and staff say those needing care are getting younger. Just ask Jordan Ayers. Appreciate what you asked. Like I would have never thought I'd be here, but I am. At 21 years old, he collapsed at home and had to be put on life support. COVID tore through his family, infecting his niece, his sister, his mother, then him. And I guess I just passed out. And then I ended up in an ambulance. Then I ended up here. As the virus brings more patients into hospital, it takes sick staff away. Those still able to report to work under even more pressure than before. We thought that the previous waves would be the end and it just keeps going. We're seeing a lot sicker, younger people sending a lot to ICU. It's pretty overwhelming. Enter the hospital's intensive care unit. The sounds here signal patients are struggling to survive. As nurses and specialists discuss the next steps for each case, they're faced with a grim reality. In a region with a vaccination rate 5% below Ontario's average, the vast majority of COVID patients in this ICU are unvaccinated. Honestly, I don't discuss vaccination right away. Sometimes the patients themselves bring it up. Some um, just will not have it even after they recover. It's tough. We'll leave you on the three or the 2.5 for now. For Randy Sams, this ordeal completely changed his mind. Get the vaccine. I was afraid of the vaccine, but you certainly don't want to be put on life support or be put out because it could cost you your life. The few empty ICU beds, a reminder some will die here, others will go home with a different perspective than before. The CBC's Thomas Dagler reporting tonight. The notion that the peak of this current wave has passed was raised by Quebec's premier today. As Sarah Levitt tells us, it's a bit of hope that has that province lifting restrictions and sending children back to school. From the premier of one of the province's hardest hit by Omicron, a ray of hope. Selon les experts, on a atteint, il y a quelques jours, un pic. He says hospitalizations may still continue to go up, but believes the wave has peaked. And so it's back to school for kids on Monday. This is a good news, important, very important for our children. But not everyone is convinced. Disbelief and utter disbelief. This mom worries that transmission could spike once kids are back in school. In the situation where we haven't done anything to improve the air quality um, in classrooms, I just, I, I'm just, I'm shocked. It's not normal life. Claire Baccarat thinks it's time for her 16-year-old daughter to get back to class with precautions. We cannot live at home all the time. We have to go to school, we have to go work, we have to live. But in an acknowledgement that community transmission will continue, the government says parents may be brought in to supervise classrooms if too many teachers are off sick. And there's going to be a lot of people in contact with each other who are going to come back home and potentially, uh, if they're infected, might transmit it to their family members. 
And that could set the stage for another surge in cases. If we look at uh, what's happening in the hospital, it doesn't look like it's slowing down. Um, and this is despite the fact that very few people have contact with people outside their household. The government appears to be banking on things getting better, not worse, lifting the strictest measure as of Monday, the curfew. Instead, targeting restrictions on the unvaccinated, including expanding retail locations where proof of vaccination will be required. The government saying with patience, this wave will pass. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. A major change tonight for Britain's royal family, announced today by Buckingham Palace news release. The Queen's second son, Prince Andrew, will lose his royal status and no longer be called His Royal Highness following a failed bid to have a civil sex assault case thrown out of court. Chris Brown has more on the royal fallout. His Royal Highness no more. Andrew, the Queen's second son, has lost not only his royal title, but his military honours in the UK and Canada too. He was Colonel-in-Chief of three Canadian regiments, including the Queen's York Rangers, an honour he was given back in 1999. A statement from Buckingham Palace said going forward, Andrew would fight his sexual assault case as a private citizen. We wrote to the Queen. Neil Kelly was among 150 former British military veterans who wrote the Queen an open letter saying Andrew's conduct has brought disrepute to the institution. Her Majesty the Queen obviously agrees with us that she went ahead and, and did what we, what we asked. It wasn't that much to ask, really, that Prince Andrew be treated like any other military officer. Andrew is being sued by Virginia Jufrey, who claims Andrew had sex with her when she was a teenager. I have no recollection of ever meeting this lady. None whatsoever. In an infamous 2019 BBC interview, he denied everything in spite of this photo showing them together. On Wednesday, a U.S. judge dismissed Andrew's attempt to end the case, leaving him the choice of settling or taking his chances in court. In this jubilee year, marking 70 years of the Queen's reign, Andrew's case risks overshadowing the happy moments. I think the other thing that was quite damaging, you know, to Her Majesty was the fact that when the police were trying to serve him papers, he was at one of her properties evading them. And there was questions over who's funding his legal team, who would pay if there's a settlement. Regardless of whether he eventually clears his name, the unroiling of Andrew appears to be permanent. All those titles he no longer has will reportedly be given to other family members. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Russia says talks aimed at resolving its dispute over Ukraine are hitting a, quote, dead end. Moscow met with officials from the U.S. and NATO earlier this week and today with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Briar Stewart is in Ukraine with special coverage all this week. A report today is from a port city within striking distance of Russian forces just over the border. As high-level diplomatic talks continue this week about the troop buildup near Ukraine's border, we are on the southeast coast of the country trying to get a sense of how the escalating tensions are affecting people who live here. Now, I'm standing beside the Sea of Azov, and it's a strategically important body of water. Just to give you a sense of the geography, it's north of the Black Sea, and it's connected via the Kerch Strait. Now, this is supposed to be jointly controlled by Ukraine and Russia, but in reality, the Russian vessels greatly outnumber the Ukrainian ones, so Russia has really de facto control over it. Now, we got a chance to go out on board a Ukrainian patrol ship, and during kind of the hour-long tour, we were given a chance to speak to the, the officers on board about the current situation. Uh, they say that they try not to get too close to Russian ships. They stay several kilometers back because they don't want to do anything that would spark some kind of incident. And in fact, last month, uh, there was a, an issue. There was a Ukrainian vessel, which Russia accused of trying to get through the Kerch Strait with Without permission, uh, Russia had issued a series of warnings. They accused the ship of acting provocatively. And at the time, there was a concern that it, there could really flare into something. Uh, now, as far as the geography goes here, Ukraine uh, lost all of its bases, its naval bases, when Russia seized Crimea back in 2014. So there is a real concern for Ukraine that they do not have a, a system of defense here. They do not have uh, enough ships. They do not have enough officers. So they are rushing to build a base in the city of Berdensk. Uh, they were given 
access to hundreds of millions of dollars of loans from the UK and the, the base is really in the initial stages of construction. They've uh, started to build a few buildings but it's still months off and of course the tensions are rising now. And I should also say, you know, besides just the, the risk of uh, an armed conflict, the, the frayed relationship between Ukraine and Russia is just affecting everyday life uh, on this water. What the Ukrainian uh, sailors told us was that because Russia controls this body of water, it will sometimes block or delay cargo ships from getting through, and that can affect the movement of goods, and that affects everybody who's living here. Now, as far as this city goes, uh, ethnically, it's about half Russian, half Ukrainian, and it has seen conflict before. Uh, at one point, it was even briefly controlled by Russian-backed separatists. But most of the people we've spoke with here uh, say they're, you know, they're, they're a little bit anxious, but they really do hope that uh, both sides can come to some kind of an agreement because they don't want to see more conflict erupting here. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Mariupol, Ukraine. BC is seeing fewer salmon return to its waters, and this is the fishing industry reels from record low returns. So why are Alaska's fishers hauling in the catch? We talk about two countries and very different approaches to fish after this. Cat coming down the street. I don't know, but it sounds to me like that gifted man with the bone. Sure having himself a ball. <laughs> From 1961 to 1979, Mel Davis was a globetrotter, literally. He played 300 games a year in dozens of countries, amazing and entertaining popes and presidents. They called him Trick Davis because of his ball handling techniques. Now, at 58, he's still up to his old tricks. And don't ever let him hear you say that basketball's only for the young. Don't label nobody, you know. If you, you're 50, you're 50. You want to play basketball, you want to play basketball. You're 50, you play golf, oh, that's a great thing. You're 50, you play tennis, oh, that's, that's pretty fair. Why not can you still play basketball or teach basketball? And that's what Mel Davis does. His Have Ball Will Teach program provides the basics in basketball, the importance of education, and self-respect. I was raised by two ladies. My grandmother, she was about five feet one, and my mother was about five three. And in elementary school, I'm six feet one or six two, so I'm taller than some of the teachers. But growing up in Chicago in the snow, and when I wanted to play basketball, a group of us guys would get out, get some shovels, shovel the court clean and get out there and play basketball. And for me playing basketball, that kept me out of uh, the penitentiary, it kept me out of a lot of crime, because in the area that I was in, it was the slums of Chicago. But my mom and grandmother was my inspiration of going to the university, trying to get a degree, and encouraging me in my basketball. Bingo! The Holland Globetrotters originated in 1927 in Hinkley, Illinois, and they was a group of, of black guys that couldn't go to, into the NBA, so the Holland Globetrotters was the next thing for them to be involved in. Uh, we're approximately five minutes away. When the Globetrotters are in town, it's a chance to renew old acquaintances and to meet the newest crop of basketball wizards. To play with the Harlem Globetrotters, it's exhibition basketball in the, in the beginning. But this not only being exhibition basketball, it's entertainment. After 18 years on the road, Mel's globetrotting days were finally over. He returned to Vancouver, a city he loved, and married Megan, a friend for over 35 years. Another constant in his life is his love of the game. Bad ball, bad ball. Bingo. If you can fall down, get yourself back up. This is what is taught to me and was taught to me about basketball. And from basketball, that was taught to me in life. Check it, baby. Now.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight for you on CBC Vancouver News. I feel more comfortable for the teachers because it's protecting them, right? There are more calls tonight for other school districts in BC to follow Delta's lead and mandate teachers and staff to disclose their vaccine status. Delta says it would have preferred a province-wide mandate and it hopes its new rules don't make it a target for anti-vaccine protesters. The district will foot the bill for the rapid tests, which will be required for staff who are unvaccinated. Drivers are being urged to slow down as crews rush to repair BC roads riddled with potholes. The south coast and the island have been hit with a roller coaster ride of weather this winter. That means perfect conditions for the craters. Surrey says it's dealing with hundreds of holes far more than normal. Saanich, Nanaimo and Vancouver are all dealing with similar situations. The Port of Vancouver is imposing tighter environmental restrictions on container trucks. The new policy will ban trucks older than 10 years old from accessing the port. As Donella Hamilton reports, it's causing a lot of strife for some drivers already grappling with pandemic challenges. Parminder Brar says finding work as a truck driver has been hard enough during the pandemic, and now he's worried the Port of Vancouver's new rolling truck program will put even more pressure on those who work in the trucking industry. It's not that much work either, so either you have to find a second job somewhere, Otherwise, you can't survive. You can't even feed your family. Brar is a member of the United Truckers Association, an organization that has been flooded with calls from worried truck drivers. If someone invests $200,000, a smaller company or owner operator, the problem is that is there a job assurance? No. The association has written to the port, urging it to delay the measure, citing the significant expense of replacing trucks and an extreme shortage of trucks at dealerships. Singh says he doesn't understand why the regulations are being applied just to port truckers. This policy is to be implemented just only for the four terminals out of 100 different venues of Port of Vancouver. So which means it's a totally a targeting just to kick out the smaller owner operators and small companies. Singh says if the rolling truck program is not postponed, some drivers will have no choice but to leave the industry or go on strike. If they push out 20% of the container truckers, you're going to see immediate impacts across the entire supply chain. Some in the trucking industry say the new policy is a step in the right direction. Worst air quality for diesel particulate, uh, that fine particulate matter and oxides of nitrogen and sulfur, uh, was the Ninth Street Corridor. Earl says the trucking industry was made aware of the pending policy changes in June of last year. We've had a formal process in place now for about six or seven months to say, look, we've got options. You can keep what you have and make it compliant or you can get something else. He says there are still trucks across North America burning diesel with no emission controls, just like back in the 1980s. Brar says with limited work and rising costs of living, it's left some drivers without options. What I'm gonna do, like, do I have to go back to the highway work? So then I'm gonna leave my children behind here or uh, I don't know, like it's, it's so hurtful to even thinking about that. The Port of Vancouver's new policy will take effect February 1st. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Surrey. Salmon runs in BC are already at record lows and now commercial fisheries in Alaska are adding to the problem. A new independent report claims interception fisheries in southeast Alaska are catching millions of salmon headed to our waters. BC has implemented initiatives to replenish depleted stocks, but many salmon species pass through Alaskan waters on their way to spawn in Canadian rivers. Researchers say around 469,000 Skeena sockeye were caught by Alaska fishermen. That's more than double from their first estimate of 200,000. For more on the severe impacts of declining salmon runs here in BC, we're joined by Greg Taylor, the fisheries advisor for the Watershed Watch Salmon Society. Greg, first of all, how large are these numbers? Can you put them in context? These numbers are very large relative to the declining abundance and productivity of Canada salmon, BC salmon populations. Very dramatic numbers. Um, for instance, this year in, the, in Alaska, caught 30% of, uh, of a Skeena, sockeye salmon returning to the Skeena in a year where uh, Canadian fishermen never got off the beach. Now, a lot of, of, of salmon meant for BC or our salmon 
is ending up uh, on what's called the District 104 fishery on the outer coast of the Alaskan Panhandle. How are they intercepting those runs bound for the BC coast? I'm, brought, I'm glad you brought that up because while there's uh, a total catch of 800,000 sockeye and unknown numbers of pinks, chum, steelhead, chinook all being caught because they're all comb migrating at the same time. So you, we've got good numbers on the sockeye. We don't have great numbers on the other species, but they're all migrating together. So we know they're also Canadian populations are all getting impacted. The fishery with the most uh, proportionally the largest impact on our Canadian fish is this called District 4 fishery, which, which takes place on the outside of the Alaskan panhandle. You think the next, next stop is Japan when you're out there. And of course, our fish coming back from the Pacific are bouncing down that beach and getting caught. Now this fishery, what's important about this fishery is it does not need to exist. Alaska can still catch all its fish because all its fish are going into the inside towards Ketchikan, all those streams. So at 25%, those 50 fishermen fishing out there could easily move on the inside. Alaska could still harvest all their fish while uh, stopping the uh, indiscriminate interception of Canadian salmon and steelhead. So uh, has anyone asked them to move? Like, what, uh, how, do you, how do you tell them that what they're doing is impacting BC in such a severe way? Well, of course, uh, they have been told, and the de uh, this District 4 fishery would not exist, does not exist anywhere else in Alaska. And that's because it's, it, it contravenes the state constitution. They have to meet uh, management objectives for their salmon populations. Uh, at, they've actually got much more rigorous management system than Canada. But because this is, these are Canadian fish, they're not bound by those same requirements. And so this fishery goes, goes unchecked. We crammed a lot in there, and I know it, it usually goes pretty fast. So thanks, uh, thanks again for, for uh, speaking with us today. Well, thank you a lot, Dan. It was, uh, it's a really important subject, yeah. and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to uh, do it. Live look at Buenos Aires. That's in Argentina, where this may evening it is a muggy 27 degrees. Early summer down there, but the weather there very much mirroring our early summer of record heat. Those records are smashed, with some climbing into the mid-40s. Johanna looks at the record heat worldwide. Coming up. And at 6.42, a live look from our studios tonight. BC Place in purple, no longer cold and chilly here as well. The grain gone for now. Johanna will be back as well with her BC-wide forecast after this.
In the year 2050, how will BC look? From agriculture to cities, how will climate change change life? Don't miss 2050 Degrees of Change, a CBC Vancouver original podcast, now available. Welcome back. It will come as no surprise to British Columbians, but 2021 was one of the hottest years on record. Sixth, to be precise. That's in the annual report by NASA and the National Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the U.S. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us again with more on that data. Uh, Joe, take us through the significance of these latest findings. Well, Dan, the eight last years have been the eight hottest years on uh, planet Earth, so it does come as no surprise. But what is surprising is that we still ranked sixth despite this being a La Nina year. And those of us from British Columbia know that that usually means cooler than normal. Let me just remind you of the trends. Take a look at the bigger picture. Uh, an El Nino, of course, usually means warmer than normal temperatures around Earth. And a La Nina in the equatorial Pacific waters, the upwelling of cold waters deep below the ocean surface usually means not only colder and wetter for us in Western Canada, uh, but that's a pattern that dampens temperatures all over the world. So to still rank six uh, did come as a bit of a surprise to scientists. And Dan, just to put that into perspective, the last time that Earth had a global temperature that was below normal was 1976. That means 69% of people on Earth today have never experienced a global temperature below normal, and that uh, really puts it into context. It's stunning, Joe. Now, earlier this week, though, European scientists said 2021 was the fifth hottest year on record. What's the discrepancy there? So multiple scientific agencies around the world, six uh, actually studied the same numbers. Uh, Peer-reviewed methods with slightly different methods ended up uh, putting that ranking somewhere between five and eight. Uh, differences between, for example, how they filled in the spaces between stations. But the consensus is there, the trend is warming. And just to take you back to pictures from our own province over the past six months, we've of course seen uh, those extreme temperatures uh, in our uh, June heat wave and the warming earth, you know, having impact not only when it comes to extreme weather, uh, but a warmer ocean uh, is rising uh, temperatures and these uh, rising sea levels, I should say, and these land temperatures certainly having a, a big uh, impact on weather patterns all around the world. And scientists are starting to see a trend that might indicate uh, the warming of our Earth is actually starting to accelerate. And it's going to continue down that path as long as we have uh, CO2 in our atmosphere. I want to take you back to another 2021 summary. Uh, we've added up the numbers for YVR. So this is just a look at Vancouver's numbers for 2021, and it has been a year of extremes. Interestingly, we have seen extreme heat and extreme cold, and that meant our average temperatures were pretty much around seasonal based on our last 30-year average anyway. Uh, the maximum temperature around 14 degrees on average, minimum 6.9, and in brackets I've put the uh, seasonal, and you can see really not that far from the seasonal. Uh, rain was only about four millimeters under the average, uh, the max temperature and the min temperature, those are shocking, 32.4 for YVR and minus 15.3. Also really a reminder that YVR is such a, a microclimate in its own, you know, very different weather patterns as you head out to the Fraser Valley and the interior, for example. Uh, it's so nice to have a quieter spell of weather, as we mentioned earlier, high pressure building across the province for the next few days, three down and through Kelowna, three up towards Prince George tomorrow, still above seasonal, and that goes for that eight in Victoria. And we will see some rain up towards Pai de Gwai, Prince Rupert, and some marine fog down towards Metro Vancouver. So uh, waking up to some drizzle, and that fog may linger a little longer. We might see some sunny breaks on the back end of the day tomorrow, uh, but generally uh, watch for a cloudy day. Saturday, that system uh, looks to bring sort of all day of showers, hoping to get mm -hmm. some sunshine on the back end of the weekend. But Dan, nothing too extreme, nothing too crazy, and that sounds pretty good. It does. Thank you, Joe. Yep. You're welcome. Arctic regions in Canada and around the world could be facing a slow motion earthquake. The permafrost that supports buildings, roads and pipelines has been slowly warming for the past four decades. That infrastructure could start to buckle and collapse, causing tens of billion do billions of dollars in damage. Not to mention concerns about the billions of tons of carbon that have been locked in the frozen ground for millennia. 
Permafrost consists of a lot of various components. It consists of ice, consists of air, different types of uh, soil and organic materials that exist in it. Okay, so that makes it a little bit complicated when it comes to response to those warming climatic conditions. Warming, not necessarily thawing of permafrost, is also detrimental because warmer permafrost supports less weight. So if it warms beyond those standards that were used uh, prior to construction, right, then infrastructure is in trouble. And it is not uh, like earthquake. It's not things collapsing, right? It's still, it's a relatively slow process. So uh, it gives uh, enough time to mitigate it. This carbon uh, impact on uh, thawing permafrost on greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it's uh, like, well, in 50 years and 100 years. So um, the impact on infrastructure is already today. It's not local problems only or even regional. It could be global problems because of this uh, energy security, military security, all kind of things uh, impacting not just local communities, not just regional governments, but actually whole entire country or even global. So are you a Wordle fan yet? If you've taken to the simple but addictive game, you are not alone, but some knockoffs have enthusiasts furious while they're trying to get a slice of the word pie. Next. Carol Thibault and I am the owner of Georgia. She is a three and a half year old old English sheepdog and uh, she's had a lot of personality since uh, she was a puppy. She does a lot of activities that you might expect humans would do. She watches TV and uh, she dances. There was one moment when it really became clear to us that she was dancing to the beat of the music. She was just 11 months old and uh, the Keith Urban song came on and she was just rocking out. She's got a great dance to a Brian Adams song. Yeah, she just likes the rhythm and the beat. We try to do a post every day uh, because it makes us feel good and it seems to make other people feel good. So the first time she danced to the Keith Urban song, it was like, we have to post this. And that video had a lot of, uh, a lot of hits. Uh, a lot of people really enjoyed watching it around the world. So now when we post, uh, we post her dancing, you know, we hear from people all over the world who just want to say that made my day. Maybe people have had a rough week or I've had a rough week and uh, Georgia just happens to have danced and I've gotten it on video. So posting it is, you know, I usually put a comment. I hope this brings a smile. Yes, plants do clean the air. I'm Robert Salisbury. NASA told us this. It's been going on since 1984. They've been doing studies about plants in space helping us survive the conditions without natural oxygen. Let's talk about a few of them right now. You're looking at one of the oldest plants in the world, Boston fern, any fern really. They suck formaldehyde right out of the air. They store it in their roots. Formaldehyde is the nasty stuff that comes out of your couch, your carpet, really a lot of things around the house. Spider plants are one of the easiest plants to keep and grow. You really just cut these guys off and throw them in the dirt and they will suck formaldehyde right out of the air. They're one of the few plants that actually pick away at any carbon monoxide kicking around. English ivy are one of the classic plants to grow, houseplant or outside. They grow like crazy and they clean up all the air around them. A lot of people even put them in the bathrooms to clean up trace amounts of airborne feces. Yes, you heard it here, folks. Last but not least, Sansevieria or snake plant or even mother-in-law's tongue. This guy is a pro at taking benzene out of the air. Benzene is released by electronics, your printer, your computer. So it's a great one for the office. When it comes to how many air cleaning plants, NASA thinks two per hundred square feet. That's a 10 by 10, two per room. Even one will make a difference. It'll just clean up the air that we breathe.
It's called Wordle. If you haven't heard about it yet, you will. It's the new online game that's become a bit of a sensation. And as Aaron Collins shows us, it's also seen by many as an ideal pandemic pastime. For millions around the world, this is a new part of their daily routine. Oh, that's a small vapor, but I'm gonna do it anyways. Wordle, six chances to guess a five letter word, but the online game has a catch. Just one word, one puzzle per day. It's almost like that economy of not having too much, right? Not giving, just giving you a little bit of a, a little bit of a snippet. At this board game cafe, Wordle's concept immediately familiar. It seems like it's based on like a really old game, like Mastermind and Boggle, like, but it's like mashed up together. A new take on older games, but some enigmatologists, that's a puzzle expert, say it's a perfect fit for the pandemic. It's like, okay, this is my new ritual every morning. Maybe it's my cup of coffee and just kind of doing this. Okay, I'm ready for this. I did really well. I'm ready to do my work at home or I'm ready to kind of go on with my day. Of course, before players do that, many brag online to friends and family about how they did. And as soon as you share your results, everyone's like, oh, hey, I could try that. How come it took me six tries and, you know, how are you doing this? You feel like you're part of this bigger thing because I know it's taken off. The world got so big, copycat games began to spring up. Apple stepped in, removing them from its app store, ensuring Wordle fans will still be limited to one word per day. A way to help weather the pandemic, according to this gaming expert. Break a, a negative cognitive uh, thinking state that you're in and distract yourself for a short while with something that can uh, help you enter a more positive state. Well, back at the cafe, that idea rings true. What's the alternative? Just being at home watching Netflix? Like, you can only do that for so long until you kind of go crazy and you run out of stuff to play, right? It turns out games is a five-letter word helping many navigate these complex times. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. A new addition to one of the world's most endangered species has made its grand debut in England. Take a look. The rare Sumatran tiger cub took its first wobbly tentative steps outside yesterday at the London Zoo. There you go. This video shows the month-old cub padding across the enclosure before being scooped up by mother Geisha. Zookeepers will discover the as-yet unnamed cub's gender in a few weeks' time when it has its first health check. Sumatran tigers are one of the most endangered species on Earth. It's estimated that only 300 remain in the wild in Indonesia. Good luck, little guy. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. You can always watch our newscasts on CBC Gem, the free app. We're also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Our next local news is at 11 o'clock with yours truly, right after the National. We'll see you then.